Okay, we're going to get started. Um, our next speaker is Mike Dyke, and he's the Northeast Regional Fisheries Supervisor for the Iowa Department of Natural Resources. We're going to learn about evaluating the benefits of stream habitat uh, for the improvement of fish. Mike has a varied and extensive background with the Iowa DNR and is currently the Northeast Regional Fisheries Supervisor where he oversees management of the cold and warm water fisheries. Is there any other water? Cold um, warm. I probably left the river part <laughs> In 15 counties, geez, uh, including two fisheries management team and three trout hatcheries. He's a native of Dubuque, an avid angler. He targets walleye, crappie, and trout every chance he gets. Mike has a passion for Iowa natural resources and strives to continually improve and protect natural resources and angling opportunities in Iowa. Welcome, Mike. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Like you said, we're going to talk a little bit about the benefits of stream habitat to fish. Um, work out of the Manchester Fish Hatchery up there in Northeast Iowa. We do have a lot of rivers and streams, trout streams, and some of the larger streams, including the Cedar River, which was talked about in the last slide, and very few lakes. So we do 99% of our work on the rivers and streams and less on the lakes, so we got a little bit more experience working on those systems than some of our other management, fisheries management teams do. But the real question is why why do we want to do this? You know, we want to improve our resources out there because we get multitude of benefits, you know, between protecting property, flood control, cleaner water, increased economic benefits. But I work in the Fisheries Bureau, so our main focus is to improve fisheries. And so in my mind I'm getting other benefits in addition to better fishing when we do these types of work on the streams. And it benefits everybody in Iowa. You know, according to an Iowa State University study, you know, we have 3.1 million people in Iowa, and over half of them use rivers and streams. And there's one in everybody's back... That was quick. There's one in everybody's backyard, you know, within 20 miles. People don't necessarily like to drive very far to go to these places, but they do. But more importantly, it's creating over $130 million of personal income. That's not quite as much that's spent when people go to use these resources, but it's the jobs and the income provided from those jobs that people going to these resources create, so it's all tied together. You know, and the other thing the study found was that, you know, the factors that most attracted visitors to these areas are the natural settings and abundant fish. So if we can provide better fishing, it's going to bring these people to these, uh, these areas. You know, a little closer to home, I mentioned, you know, the, the millions of dollars in economic, or I'm sorry, in income. This is what's spent. One small stream, about two and a half miles of stream right next to our Manchester hatchery, includes Bailey's Ford Creek, which is really just the lower end of the Spring Branch. And Spring Branch Creek, the part by the hatchery, is bringing over $1.2 million to that community in that area for people fishing. And statewide alone, just our trout stream program and our urban fisheries are bringing over $27 million in money spent in these communities. People want to have something to do when they get off the work, have a quality life. If you've got jobs in an area and you have nothing for the people to do, why would you want to live there? So there's uh, several components and types of river and stream habitat work. You know, you can do the watershed work, we can reconnect the floodplain. Um, we can do riparian corridor management, stream bank stabilization, in-stream habitat. We can do all of those, and we know they all work independently, but they really work best together. Um, the rivers are part of a system, and so when you put all these pieces together, you get more longevity out of your projects. 
we try and do try and do these things in concert. You know, because we can go out and put all the habitat in we want, but if we aren't helping reduce the flooding, the water coming off the land, or reduce sediment, nutrients, those kind of things, that's, that habitat work isn't going to last near as long. So a little bit of background. Um, you know, it doesn't hurt to explain why we do what we do. I mean, I already said my main job is to make the fishing better, and we do a lot of that, but, you know, this river is a system. So if we improve water quality, improve the stream habitat, we get a better aquatic ecosystem. And diversity is the key out there. If we can provide different substrates, depth, water velocities, vegetation types, woody debris, whatever it is, we're going to have a better system. For example, there's over 127 different species of fish that live in the Mississippi River, and that's because of the differences in the habitats up there. You've got different substrates. You've got fast flowing water. You've got slow flowing water, more lake-like situations in certain areas. And sim similar to that, even the Turkey River, Northeast Iowa, has has 84 different species of fish in it. You know, it's not quite as diverse as the Mississippi River, but it's pretty diverse. 84 different species of fish. That's a lot of different species of fish in one of our systems out there. So we know we can increase, um, improve water quality and increase production, and we should try and mimic these natural systems when we're doing this type of work out there. They're all tied together. We create the different substrates and different habitats. We get different primary productivity to more invertebrates and different types of fish and other aquatic organisms that are out there. That's what provides for all this diversity. So we try and recreate these different macro habitats, so to speak, you know, pools, ripples, runs, and glides, you know, to provide the differences in water depths, provide the difference in velocities, substrates, etc so that we provide something for all the life stages of these fish from spawning to adult big fish to the small little fish, whether they're feeding, overwintering, each each DC has different types of requirements. So if we can provide that diversity, we cannot emulate that system by providing habitat out there. So a couple different examples, um, a regular, or I should say a regular, a simple, bank stabilization, taking a cut bank, sloping the banks back and seeding it to native vegetation. Now our main goal with that is to stabilize that bank, reduce the inputs of sediment into the stream, but also we slope that back so when the water does come up, it spreads out, reduces those erosive forces, and it's not cutting the bank anymore. It's just coming up and spreading out. So we're decreasing some of the flooding impacts that are going on out there. Here's another one except we used a little bit of tow rock to help stabilize that a little bit more. And actually, we installed some, some fish bank hides underneath here. So again, we slope the banks back, provide a little bit of diversity of substrate. When that flow comes around there, it creates deeper water habitat. And then the bank hides, I kind of put a little drawing in there to help explain how they work, basically you're providing overhead cover for fish. These are used more in the cold water in the, in the, for the trout because they need overhead cover from, to get away from their predators, or their predators are avian. So we, we provide that. We're also providing diversity of substrate out there for different types of invertebrates to colonize on and providing that deeper water as that water comes around that corner. We've tried some of these in, in some warmer water, larger stream for smallmouth bass, but they don't seem to work as well. Those, those fish do telemetry work, which you come to find them, they like rock better than they like overhead cover. And that's probably more a factor of what they're feeding on or hiding in. Um, some channel training structures we use as in-stream to create in-stream habitat as well. You know, vortex weir, higher on the edges out here, but then drops down to channel that flow to create a plunge pool, get that deeper water habitat. One of the things we find through our sampling is that you gotta have deep water to have big fish. If you 
you've got just shallow water, no places for those fish to go, and more more food in terms of smaller fish, other species of fish. Then you don't have the big fish. You have a lot of little fish, but people like to catch big fish, so that's what we're trying to create. So we get that whole range of that life life cycle of that fish out there. And then we can use other other things such as the J hooks, bend away weirs, and rock deflectors to guide the water where we want to use its own energy to create that deep water habitat and guide it to areas we want to. Um, some uh, larger streams that we've worked on, this, this is on the Makokita River, two different sites where we stabilize this bank, sloped it back again so that when it comes up, but then added these rip logs and locked logs. These logs are actually 15, 20 foot long and they're buried in there so that when we do have higher flows, it's not taken out. The flows aren't ripping those trees out of the, out of the bank and sending them downstream. You know, and, and on this one, the flow is going from this direction to that direction. Same on this one here. We didn't, uh, this one's going to get seeded with, uh, with grasses to stabilize that bank. But again, it's sloped back. It doesn't look like it's just the angle of the photo, but it's sloped back in a four to one or greater if we have the room. You know, and this one was highly armored. It depends on one, where we're getting our funding from. You know, we have to meet certain specifications if it's an NRCS project or a FEMA project versus if, if we're spending the money on it in terms of fisheries. But the other thing is, what do we got for infrastructure behind it? And this landowner, this is on private land, this landowner wanted to protect his, his crop field back there. So we worked with him. We still got a stabilized bank, less input into the river itself, and we got a lot of fish habitat out of working with that landowner. So it's all good. Um, some other types are these dam modifications. Uh, the Charles City the gentleman that spoke prior to me, they put in a whitewater course. This is one example of a, a rock arch rapids. So there's a lot of those going on, mainly due to the safety, but they also improve our, our fisheries out there by allowing the fish to get to these areas, whether it's an overwintering area that might not be in the stretch below or to, to pass upstream so we have a more diverse fish community upstream because certain fish are blocked by the drops in the stream. So, so we're working on this stuff as well. So to get into uh, why I'm really here is to talk about how do we evaluate these projects. You know, there's a lot of stream habitat down in, in North America period and then in Europe as well. But us and I, with the NR Fisheries Bureau, started working on it late in the 1930s. We go back to the handwritten journals of some of our biologists. They were doing fish or fish habitat work back in the day. And one of the things, you know, our techniques have really improved. We learn from our mistakes and we grow from it. And we get better every time we do a project. You know, we go to go to uh, workshops and improvement things, we learn more about hydrology and hydraulics, so we're working with the river instead of against it. So we're, we're getting pretty good. And back in the 90s, we really ramped up our habitat work when we started working with our conservation partners and cost sharing. You know, we don't have, have enough money in the fisheries bureau to do all the work that we really like to do out there. So we work with anybody that's willing to work to improve the fish habitat and try and get these multiple benefits out of these projects. Um, in the trout program alone, we've worked with over 38 different partners. And I got a small smattering of them listed there, but you know, we'll work with anybody that's willing to, to do this work. Um, like I said, you know, we can look in the literature um, and we're constantly reading up on this. Most of us are members of the American Fisheries Society, peer-reviewed journal publications. We're checking out what's going on. This one's in, in Washington. This one's in Wyoming. This one's down in Arkansas. Uh, this one's in Wyoming again. Uh, a couple of Minnesota projects that I got. You know, I just 
copied of several of these, and there's a lot of work done in Wisconsin as well. And the same types of waters we work in, you know, you try and regionalize it based on our, our water types. You know, we're up in the Karst area, we have a lot of a lot of similarities with Wisconsin and Minnesota that we won't typically have in the Mountain West where that's all snow runoff. So we realize that. But some of our, our information that we've collected on our on our screens here in Iowa, I'm going to show you here. On the left is the number of brown trout per mile. Over here and across the bottom is a uh, year. And we go out and sample, typically using electrofishing gear to stun the fish, pick them up, measure, weigh them, put them back. We can get a lot of information out of just lengths and weights of fish. But this is just showing abundance data here. And we put in habitat on these vertical black bars in these years here. And we can see that we got an increase in, in the population, but then it subsequently went down where on this one, you know, we had a heavy rainfall event that filled in the habitat with sediment a little, and then also took some of the habitat out. So the population has responded accordingly to that habitat. Um, another one on the right here in Simon Gill Creek put in habitat, the vertical bars in that population has increased substantially. Um, just to get an idea, some of the work that we do, you know, we're talking 800 foot of stream bank stabilization and 18 bank hives. And if you want to do the math, their hives are usually eight foot long, so 18 times eight is how many feet of hives we would put in a, on a trout stream. But we always have bank stabilization that's tied in to some of the overhead cover that we're working in, and including the in-stream stuff. We're putting in vortex, we have always got a section of, you gotta key that stuff into the bank and make sure it doesn't go around it. Um, a little better example here is uh, on Spring Branch Creek, it's right at the hatchery, so it seems to get a lot of attention. You know, our, our teams don't have to drive very far, so they like to work close to home. Um, this is a, a really good instance where we only put one, you know, we put 190 feet of hides and did bank stabilization along with it. We only did it once. And we can see the increase in the fish, number of fish, as the actual population estimate, where we did a mark recapture and estimated the number of total fish in the stream section. And we can see we got increases. The blue line are fish greater than six inches, the red line are fish greater than 10 inches, and this greenish line is fish greater than 14. So the key on this is that, you know, we were able to increase the small fish, but in got a, a small increase in the larger fish here, but it's kind of really stayed the same. It's increased a little bit, but at this other site, we were able to increase it quite a bit. You know, this is from zero to 100, you know, and in a 200 foot stretch of stream, you know, that's pretty good to get that many fish in that stretch there of that size. So if you want to go catch some big trout, this is a really good stream to do. And the response due to the fish habitat has created those increases. Um, an example on a little larger river, how important stream habitat is the fish it was on the Coquita River below Lake Delhi. One of our best smallmouth populations in the state was below this dam here. And when it breached in 2009, this is the dam actually breaching, and the, the lake dewatered while well, it started the head cut up, and you can see the amount of sediment that moved downstream when this dam breached. Water quality, you can really see the changes there. We went from this to this the whole time that this lake was head cutting, probably five miles upstream until working with a uh, river program, Nate Hogabeen, we put in a rock arch rapid before just to stop the head cut. Um, a good example of the changes that occurred pre dam breach in the section of the stream below the dam. The blue bars here are mostly coarse substrate, gravel, cobble, boulder. 
very little sand, mud, silt, or clay prior to the breach, post breach, we went to all soft sediment. Well, not all, but the majority of it. There's a little bit of sand in there, but you don't see very, very little cobble and gravel in it. That's what's reflected over here is the percent of fine substrate. Pre breach, it was less than 15% soft sediment or fine sediments, and post. It's really fine sediment. So basically, we buried all the habitat that was out there with sand and silt. And the other thing that happened too, because we filled in all that habitat, are with the depth, depth ratio change. If it was narrow and deep, now it's got wider and shallower. So you don't have that deep water habitat anymore. We can see the changes in the fish community in the area. We had a decrease in the total biomass of fish out there from 347,000 pounds, you know, down to 311 and now down to 197,000 pounds. We had a change in the fish community in terms of lake type species such as channel catfish and common carp were very low in abundance before, now they're higher in abundance. Um, riverine type species such as northern hogsucker, red horse, and smallmouth were pretty high percent of the composition of fish out there and after post dam breach it went down. Now they're coming back up again but it's been slow and we never we weren't able to sample that section of screen this last year because we had too little water we had drought in Iowa and we can't sample that area with the boat shocker effectively. Um, and the take home message on this one, you know, our focus is on the smallmouth bass, right release area, trophy smallmouth bass. We had built that the population had been building. This is fish.